amid all the political theatre and, and real concern as well as we see the capital overtaken in such way, this is a pandemic on our hands. It's not just one health crisis of COVID. There's other health crises afoot, one that you can speak to. Well, that's right, Caroline, and nice to be with you this afternoon. Um, I hope we all feel we can see a light at the end of the pandemic tunnel. Um, there are a lot of reasons, I think, to be encouraged that we have now what we need uh, or certainly are approaching the point of having what we need uh, to wrestle this pandemic to ground. Uh, so I'm optimistic about what we see from the vaccines, optimistic about the role that the monoclonal antibodies can play, uh, encouraged about some recent developments around the anti-inflammatory medicines and their contribution to helping patients get well. Uh, and so, you know, across the waterfront, I think we see a lot of progress being made against uh, the, the biology of this virus. So that's all very encouraging. And I, I think when you talk about the secondary healthcare crisis, what we have to recognize is that something like two thirds of uh, Americans have canceled or postponed uh, a doctor's visit uh, for things like cancer screening or uh, things like uh, heart disease, uh, osteoporosis. And so, in fact, I understand that the, the uh, order for standard lab tests is still down something like 20% versus pre-COVID levels. Osteoporosis visits are, are in the 60 to 80% range of what they were before COVID. Cardiovascular visits, cancer screening, also about 80% of what they were before COVID. So we need to be mindful that hundreds of thousands of people are, are at increasing risk of those chronic diseases as a result of either delaying or not being routinely uh, in connection with their doctors. Well said. And it's interesting, of course, your focus on the therapeutics and the treatment side of the equation when it comes back to COVID-19 at the moment, Bob. And how are you seeing the deployment of such treatments? How are you seeing the deployment and the infrastructure that's being built in the United States for the vaccine as well? Well, I think first, Caroline, it's worth uh, making the point that, um, you know, this has been all hands on deck. This has been an extraordinary effort uh, across industry, academia, government, uh, to bring to bear uh, solutions for this crisis. And the speed at which that's happened and the quality of what uh, looks to have been advanced through clinical development is also extraordinary. Uh, so again, the fact that we have in less than 12 months not one vaccine, but several vaccines that look to be as effective as 90 plus percent uh, in preventing the infection from this virus is truly extraordinary. Um, you know, when you think about prior vaccine development, I think the fastest ever was something like four years per month. So the fact that we've been able to develop effective therapies as quickly as we have, I think, is a real testament to the power of innovation and, and in particular, uh, a testament to the power and importance of biotechnology. Uh, monoclonal antibodies are an important part of the story as well. Uh, several antibodies have been approved, uh, in particular, to try to reduce the risk for high-risk patients. Uh, we are uh, associated with Eli Lilly and their antibody, as you said in your introductory remarks, Caroline, and the data there have shown on the order of 75% reduction in the risk of hospitalization for high-risk patients uh, when treated early in the course of their infection with uh, an antibody uh, oh. or with Lilly's antibody. Yeah. Uh, so, of course, you know, the frustrating thing is that not more people are getting those uh, medicines right now. And I, I know that's something that HHS and, and others are focused on. And we hope that uh, the word will get out to physicians that this is an important way uh, to consider treating patients to prevent their disease from progressing and uh, having their patients wind up in a hospital setting. I am curious, though, so, I mean, when you talk about the secondary uh, health crisis here, Bob, and obviously the, a lot of us have not really gone to a doctor for any sort of routine care uh, during the pandemic for obvious reasons. Um, mm -hmm. There's also people who have not uh, taken their drugs, uh, their medicines that they may have needed uh, in the same fashion. And I know that's had, that's had an effect on sales uh, for some pharmaceutical companies out there. I am curious as to when you expect that to sort of right size itself and you start to see that that uptake uh, return to normal? Well, I think it has affected all of us, uh, for sure. Um, and, you know, I think we still have several months of disruption to work through. Um, I think that it's very likely that, you know, at some point in 2021, we'll feel that we've returned to something like the status quo uh, that existed uh, before the pandemic uh, in the first quarter of 2020. But I think we still have some weeks and months to go before we'll be at that point. Uh, and, um, you know, the good news is that um, innovative companies, um, physician groups, patients have all adopted 
uh, new ways of interacting with one another. So virtual uh, telemedicine, for example, uh, virtual training for doctors about innovative new medicines uh, like those that we and others are advancing through the clinic, even in the midst of this pandemic. Uh, so we have adapted. Uh, physicians, patients, as I said, have adapted. And uh, the good news is we're beginning to rebuild uh, something like the, you know, the level of activity that uh, will be required in order to prevent um, what you're calling the secondary health care crisis. And I think it's an important thing to shine a spotlight on. Uh, it would be a shame if after all the, uh, the pain and suffering of uh, COVID-19 that uh, we allowed that to happen in our society, particularly right. for diseases where uh, we can predict uh, who's at risk and prevent them from developing disease by getting therapy to them early. Is the future growth of your company coming from your pipeline and not M&A? Uh, yes, uh, Caroline. We're uh, through the first nine months of the year, our uh, revenues were up about 9% uh, and volumes were up double digits. Uh, and our growth is coming from recently launched products like Amavig for migraine, like Repatha for heart disease. Uh, our biosimilar medicines as well are growing rapidly, as well as our recently acquired uh, medicine for uh, inflammation, Otesla. Uh, so our recently launched products are a source of growth for us, for sure. Uh, we have two uh, medicines now that have been designated breakthrough therapies by FDA, and we're anxious to have those reviewed, one in cancer, a, a product called Sudoracid, and another for asthma called Tezepelumab. So both novel, uh, potentially very important therapies for patients. And again, we're really pleased that even through the pandemic, we've been able to continue to advance those on schedule. Well, what's so fascinating about your business is it's so global in nature, such a vast business, but also one that intersects with politics in some way. And I'm sure that you would want to pay some sort of lip service to what we've just seen in terms of basically the riots that we've seen in the capital, but also your future relationship with the Biden administration going forward, whether it be future your your ongoing venture, of course, the relationship, close relationship you have with China and collaborations there, but also how you see the relationship of biotechnology and the administration and politics and regulation going forward. Well, there's a lot there, uh, Caroline, in your question. And I <laughs> certainly like to pay more than lip service to what it is that happened yesterday. In yeah. the I think what all of us watched in Washington was appalling. And after all the trauma that we've been through as a, as a society over the past year, you know, it's time to move on now. It's time to pick up the pieces. It's time to begin rebuilding trust in our institutions. Uh, and we're looking forward to working with the new administration and with elected officials on both sides of the aisle to try to end this pandemic, to try to make the changes necessary to see that patients can get access to the innovative medicines that uh, are so challenging for them to get today and to do that while preserving the infrastructure that enables us to innovate like we have uh, through COVID-19. Uh, again, there's an extraordinary, you know, when the history book is written about 2020, uh, the, the progress that we made with biology to be able to wrestle this pandemic to ground is going to be a very important part of what's written. And we need to make sure that we preserve the ecosystem that's necessary for that kind of innovation. What we need is more, not less innovation. And so the changes that we need to make are ones that uh, need to be made in the context of preserving the incentives for being able to do that kind of work.